to me, my loyalty is to the values that I espouse. The fact that there happens to be a state that claims that I am part of it or it's part of my identity has got nothing to do with my values. If it does not, if they don't share my values, then there's no loyalty. There's no there's no call for loyalty. You know, you cannot support Israel if you believe in justice, uh, freedom, and human rights, because there's a 75 year history that shows that Israel stands against all of that. Um, you cannot oppose the Palestinians' call for justice and humanity and and and, and equality. And it doesn't matter if you're right or left. I mean, if you believe in those, if you believe in those values, then you, then you then it makes perfect sense to support the Palestinian call for justice, equality, and freedom. The state of Israel has been engaged in terrorism since before it was even established. The Zionist movement in Palestine had brought terrorism to Palestine. If we believe in zero tolerance to racism, there should Zionism should not have a room anywhere because it's a racist ideology. So, all right, as you you might expect, I'm probably going to push back on some things you might say. I I don't know what you're going to say. I've just, you know, prepped the interview. And sometimes people get a bit upset about this, either the guest or the, the listener. And I'm not totally sure why. I think conversations like that. They hold people to intellectual honesty. It gets more out of the conversation. So you'll you'll find in me a friendly audience generally. But of course, I'm still planning to take you to task on some of your ideas, possibly, just as I do with most guests on this show, especially with a divisive topic like this. So I'm telling you this because I think sometimes people think I'm just pushing their buttons because I'm some kind of a hole, and, and and that's not really my aim. Even though I also happen to be maybe a little bit of an a hole, but you're Israeli. You should be used to opinionated loudmouths by now. Not a problem. <laughs> so tell, tell me how you grew up. I know you grew up, very, well, very Israeli, very patriotic Israeli. Yes, I mean, I grew up, uh, I mean, when, when it's you, you think it's perfectly normal. You just grew up as a kid. You go to school, you, you know, whatever. But um, I, uh, my father had carried a huge legacy. He was part of this generation of, of officers who were young officers in 1948, when the state of Israel was established, and they're considered, you know, gods. And then he was a general. He remained in the military. He had a career in the military. He stayed in the army and then uh, in the service of his, of his country. And then he was one of the generals of the 1967 war, which, again, is one of these uh, epic moments in the history of the region. And again, as an Israeli kid, particularly as a kid, but for Israelis, that generation of generals, again, are you know, gods of the Olympus. And then, uh, so I grew up with that. Plus, I had a great uncle who was the president. I had a grandfather who signed the Declaration of Independence. I had all these people around, you know, in, in my extended family who were all, you know, the the the, four, the fathers of the state, so to speak, and then held important positions once Israel was established. And so certainly I was a, I was a patriot and I lived in this reality that I thought was a reality. I didn't realize there was another reality because Israelis, we live in a bubble. And that was my upbringing. That was until uh, maybe when I was in high school or, you know, something like that, when things began to change a little bit. But yeah. How did things start to change? Was it your parents who started to change? Or I, I know you moved to L.A. as a kid. Was that the beginning of this? No, not at all. My we I, I moved to we moved to L.A. My father retired from the military in uh, 68. And then he moved. We moved to L.A. for a few years to, for, to finish his Ph.D. at UCLA. So that I was a kid. But in uh, another thing that my father did after he retired, he began to talk about this idea of a Palestinian state and this whole thing that there is such a thing as Palestinians because we just call them Arabs. And he started talking about the PLO and he started talking about the need to negotiate and the need to give them their own rights, granted on a small parcel of, of what was historically Palestine. And that was that was huge. People started attacking me, attacking him. You know, he was a traitor. Suddenly, he went from this you know national hero and you know huge figure to suddenly becoming a, kind of a pariah and all that kind of stuff. So then I was in high school, and that's kind of when I began to realize that there's something going on here that maybe you know it's not all as rosy and wonderful and patriotic as I thought. Um, and there was a story that I mentioned in my book in the General Sun that my mother told me many, many times, which is when she was 22 years old in 1948, and the Zionist militia, which later on became the Israeli army, uh, took Jerusalem. They kicked out 
you know, the Palestinian population. I mean, the ethnic cleansing was ab- ab- absolute. Not a single Palestinian remained in West Jerusalem. And their homes are, were made available to Israelis. She was offered a home. And these are gorgeous homes. They were they're called Arab homes, the Palestinian homes in West Jerusalem. The neighborhoods are still there. Are really beautiful homes. And uh, she was living in a small apartment with her mother. And she was already a mother herself. And she was offered this wonderful home. And she refused. She said, how could I possibly live in, in a home of somebody who was thrown out, kicked out? And, and then she talked about how they looted and stole. The Israelis looted and stole things. And as a kid growing up, that story didn't make sense because it, it, it was contrary to the narrative. It was contrary to the history and the story of, of, of the heroism that I was led to believe was true. It was later, much later on in life that I went to talk to her again about that story and, and had the full picture. But, you know, so there were, there were cracks in, the, in, that, in that wall gradually moving on, going up. And I was in the military and Israel invaded Lebanon. That was another big crack. Not a very serious crack in the in the uh, in the wall of of faith in our in our in our righteousness. Yeah, the, the, tell me a little bit about that. So you joined the IDF because everybody in Israel has to join the IDF. Well, pretty much, unless you're like what super religious is that the or disabled? I guess is are, are those the rules? Yeah, well, those are pretty much the yeah. Unless you're somehow disabled or you're uh, you can prove that you're uh, you know ultra orthodox. Uh, yeah. Why don't Jesus. ultra-Orthodox Jews have to serve? I never quite understood that because I'm like, okay, you're able-bodied and it's not like you have a pacifist objection because a lot of those same people are like Likud party sort of, not all, but like right-wingy kind of folks in Israel. So it's not like, they're not like peacenik. So so I don't I don't get that. No, they are peaceniks. That community, they are peaceniks. They, they are, are uh, okay. for, forbidden from, the, first of all, they're, they're forbidden. From, Jews are forbidden from from carrying weapons. And then number two, the, they are a deeply religious community. The army is completely secular. Men and women mix. The food is not kosher. I mean, they wouldn't dream of, of sending their kids. Uh, separation of, of men and women is, is absolute in that community. In the army, there's no such thing. And so uh, there was an agreement very early on when Israel was established. They don't want the army. The army really doesn't want them. I mean, who wants a, a group of you know, ultra-religious, uh, in, you know, I mean, it was a pain. So there was this, this status quo. Everybody agreed that that was going to be a thing. About 20 years ago, a new a group of politicians that entered the stage, the Israeli stage of, of, of politics, the political world, used it as a wedge issue. And they said, these are parasites. They're not carrying the weight. They are, you know, we are, you know, our, our young men and women serve while they sit around and do nothing, reading the stupid Torah, that kind of thing. Well, to them, reading the Torah and studying the Talmud is not stupid. That's what a Jew does. You know, they are deeply faithful religious community, and they are, you know. Now, there are settlers and the Kudniks, like you described, the dress like the same as those guys. So it's easy to confuse these right-wing settlers with this very righteous and, you know, really quite holy uh, community of ultra-Orthodox Jews who have a real reason. And many of them don't even recognize the state because... The idea of a, of a Jewish state is contrary to Jewish law. So, you know, there are all these different issues that are thrown into the into this thing. But wow, that's confusing because they have Israeli passports and they live in Israel, but they're like, well, we live in... They, they didn't want live... those passports. They, they asked not to be citizens. The state of Israel was established, that community, that community precedes the state of Israel. I see. You know, because there, there was a religious community in Jerusalem going back you know, a very long time. And when the state of Israel was established, they begged the United Nations to give them some kind of a special status. They did not want to be citizens of that state, huh. but nobody li- nobody listened to them. Wow. So it's not like they're enjoying the benefits and they don't want to serve. They okay. don't want the benefits. They don't want anything to do with this secular entity that to them, like I said, is sacrilegious and contrary to Jewish law. That's interesting. I never knew that because, yes, you're right. It, the, you said those guys dress alike. That's pretty much where I'm going, right? I'm thinking like Hasidic Jews or, or especially like the, with the curls and the, and the Russian hat version especially i'm like i can't tell between one that lives in the west bank in in a house that they maybe threw some palestinians out of two weeks ago and then the people that live in oak park michigan where i grew up who i'm like i can't imagine these super you know people who walk everywhere it's a very different kind of thing they just happen to have the same uniform and it sounds so ignorant saying that out loud but i'm just going to wear that on my sleeve for this episode because i mean a lot of people a lot of people are confused by it. It's, what's particularly funny is like the, 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 the big communities in New York, for example, when politicians run for office, they come to them. They're a very large community. They're a very large voting bloc. 
and they tell them how much they love Israel, and they go, okay, in this community, that is not that is not a plus. That is not something you want to show, talk to us about. We, Israel is not our thing at all. We care about other issues, but Israel, we are, uh, you know, we don't stand with Israel. That's funny. It's like, well, I, so, yeah. I came here to kiss yeah. ass, and you got to give me, throw me a bone here. Tell me which which uh, <laughs> which ring I'm yeah. supposed to kiss here, which cheek. Uh, that yeah. that is gonna that's confusing for. I'm glad I'm not the only one who who who's had that go over his head because I consider myself reasonably well informed on some of this, and it's just it's very hard to tell. There's so many different factions in inside and outside Israel, inside uh, Arab communities, Middle East communities, Jewish communities. It's, this is, this has got to be one of the more confusing conflicts. And I'm talking about even when you look at things like the genesis of ISIS and other also complex Middle Eastern stuff, this just seems to be extra. There's just layers upon layers upon. It's like Jerusalem is like a metaphor, right? You dig three feet down and there's a whole another layer of stuff you got to spend 10 years studying before you can dig any deeper. Have you, have you, ever, have you ever been there? Yeah, I used to live in uh, in East Jerusalem in Har Hatzofim, um, but oh, right. only for a short time. And mm. I wasn't going to tell the story, but I was just so ignorant. I went there because I was like, oh, study abroad. I'll go to Israel. They have something going. It'll be kind of cool to live in the Middle East. I couldn't probably live in Saudi Arabia, so I'll check out the Middle East. I only went there knowing that Israel was a democracy in the Middle East and I written Jewish. That was it. It wasn't like, I'm going to go live in the Holy Land. I had no, I didn't care about that at all. I just went there and I lived in the dorms in the French Hill and there was a house behind our dorm. And I was thinking about this when I was reading your book, there's a house behind the dorms and the, it was like weirdly out of place, right? Cause there's all these nice houses and then there's this house that's fenced in. And, and I thought like, what's the deal with this house? Why doesn't the university move this or buy this or something? And, and then I started realizing that I kept hearing rocks hitting the ground near me when I walked by the house and I was like, is someone throwing rocks at me every time I walk up to get falafel? And sure enough, there was a kid who would play outside and he would throw these rocks. And these were not little rocks. And so I went and I went through the fence and I knocked on the door and I was like, your son is throwing rocks. And she just yelled at me in Arabic and it was not a friendly conversation. And I thought, oh, okay, she doesn't understand me. Maybe she just thinks I'm trespassing. So I was friends with these Palestinian guys, these Christian guys. And I was like, hey, can you help me? This kid throws rocks at me and I just want to like, tell his mom because then she'll knock him one and he'll stop. And they were like, oh, I don't know about that. But I kept asking, kept asking. They were like, fine. They go up to the door and they were legit just screaming at each other in Arabic. And they were like, yeah, that kid's not going to stop throwing rocks at you. And I was like, what? Why? Why? And she, they're like, well, you're, they think that you're a Zionist and this is Palestinian family. This was probably all their land before. And that kid is been taught to hate everybody who walks by and you walk by here all the time. Notice that there's nobody else with taking this route ever, except to like go up to get falafel randomly. And they run up and I thought like, Oh, so this kid just thinks like I'm an invader and he kept throwing rocks at me. And the mom basically told him like, screw you. I'm not going to tell my kid to stop throwing rocks. You get off my yeah. land. That was basically right. the conversation. Yeah. Interesting. So but yeah. I, I get it, right? Like, I, 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 I guess yeah. I kind of get it. I would be pissed off, too, if yeah. my grandpa had yeah. a farm and now it was a bunch of dorms with kids who were, like, giving me the finger out the window at night. I don't know. And you probably and, and probably and you didn't get any compensation for it. The RV cam and took it. Right, yeah. I don't know how it happened, but I assume top, that's how it happened. Of, that's how it has that's to happen. That's how it happens. Yeah. That's how it happens everywhere. That's how it happens, yeah. So, yeah. so I, I, I guess it was, like, one of the— it was one of those many lessons I learned in Israel where I was like, oh, okay— this is not all sort of sunshine and, and roses, and there's people here who who are on the losing right. side of this equation in a real bad way. Right. Did you want to be a general like your dad when you were little? Because it seems like a complex situation, right? You're like, I want to be a general. I want to be pro-Israel. And then your dad's opinions start shifting, and your opinion of your dad also, and, and your political opinions start shifting. And then it's like, maybe I don't want to be a general in the IDF. Well, when I was three and four, I, okay. I did. But uh, once I grew up, <laughs> you know. And then certainly once I was old enough to actually serve, there was no way I was going to stay in the military um, any any um, one second more than I absolutely had to. What uh, what was your experience like in the IDF? Because it sounds like by by that point, were you you were mid transition from like rah rah Israel, and then you said the invasion of Lebanon started to really change your mind. What what happened? Well, you know, when I started, you know, I started all rah rah, and I was very excited to serve, like you know, every Israeli kid, and uh, especially with a family like mine, and. Um, but, you know, step by step, the things you see, and I describe it in the book, there's a chapter called The Red Beret, mm -hmm. 
you know, every kid wants to get a red beret because that's a sign. That's a kind of a sign of that's a real prestigious uh, thing. It means you're, you know, you're legit, badass. certified badass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, and I got the red beret, but uh, on the on the in the process of getting it, I noticed that we were not doing anything that had anything to do with defending anybody. We were trampling on people's land. We were we were patrolling people's um, cities that didn't want us. We were basically. We're basically the enforcers of an occupation over a people that didn't want us to be there, and I couldn't mm-hmm. understand why we were there. And then um, uh, orders to, you know, beat the brains out of anybody who looks at us, and they're giving us batons and 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 um, mm-hmm. and uh, handcuffs. And I'm going, we're 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 supposed to be like a you know a reconnaissance Police. unit. What the hell are yeah. we doing policing? Huh? And then. Um, I was eventually transferred from that unit. I was doing something else. And then the, lo- the last year of my service, the 1982, the invasion of Lebanon happened. And it was, we were told, the public was told that this was a 40 kilometer incursion to get rid of some, what they call terrorists, you know, Palestinian cells. Well, as they were telling us that it's, it's a 40 kilometer incursion, our friends were telling us they're already in the outskirts of Beirut, which is far much more you know, on yeah, the outskirts not, of Beirut. What the 40. hell are we doing in Beirut? Yeah, how, how far is that? It's like Beirut? hundreds of miles, isn't it? Or at least 100 miles? Uh, it's uh, probably yeah, but it's probably double that. Yeah, it's probably something like that. Beirut and um, really and uh, yeah, I mean, it's not hundreds and hundreds of miles, but it's not 40, 40 kilometers for sure. And why are we in Beirut? And why is Israel even, why is Israeli military even approaching an Arab capital? I mean, this is this is this is big stuff, and it made absolutely no sense. And of course, later on, as the news became clear and the politics behind it became clear, it was obviously it was obvious that the government had lied uh, to everybody, and there were heavy, heavy casualties. Israel, the Israeli military suffered very heavy casualties, and then there was resistance growing to the to the entire uh, to this entire escapade. And, and then my father, even my father, spoke. At protests against the war, anti-war protests, and this was the first time there was an anti-war protest while the war was taking place. And he was calling on Israeli soldiers to refuse to enter Lebanon, to refuse to serve. I mean, it was that it was that divisive, it was that severe. But that was that was a breaking point for a lot of people of my generation that believed and then saw that this was, you know, and then of course there was the massacres in the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila, which which uh, Israel had a very, you know, carried an important role. And so that was, you know, the beginning of the end. Yeah. I, I went down that rabbit hole with Sabra and Chatila. And if anybody wants a little more background on that, it's a it's a very not fun sort of Wikipedia deep dive into something yeah. that will shock you and not, yeah, it, yeah, it was, I, I remember doing that, looking that up because when, when I was in Israel, I, that was when Ariel Sharon. I was in Jerusalem, the old city, with my Jordanian roommate friend. What what when, years were you there? This is two thousand. So Ariel Sharon oh, went up to the um, Temple Mount to do something. I don't know, but it just resulted in me going from shopping for like a nargila hookah thing to running away. And we would run into Israeli soldiers, and I I'd be like Americans, and they'd be like, "Go that way." And then if we ran into uh, like. Arab dudes who looked like they maybe were looking for a problem. My Jordanian roommate would just yell in Arabic, we're Arabs. And they'd be like, get out of here. So we just, bar- I mean, we, we were, we barely made it out of there without getting beat up by somebody. It was just pure chaos. And we were breathing in like little, I guess, tear gas, like the, not when you get gassed, but when it's just in the air, it was a mess. That was one of the scariest, probably 40 minute, you know, runs of my young life at that point. Um, so the, yeah, that, that'll put a timestamp on it. So the Beirut, uh, the, the invasion of Lebanon thing and you being in the military at that time, I mean, you can't, were you just like, okay, I'm done. I'm waiting my service out. I'm pulling the plug. Or was it like, I'm, were you able to get Absolutely. out early? No, no, no. Well, I got out a few weeks early. So what happened was the, um, uh, people of my generation that were the same cycle in terms of being enlisted. Uh, and that, and were supposed to be um, released. So the invasion began in June, and so a year later, people's uh, service was extended. They weren't releasing people, and I'm like, oh my god! If they extend my thing, I will lose my lose my you know lose it. Thankfully, I, I was supposed to be released the following January, and I was actually released in December. For some reason, they said they didn't need people anymore, and, and everybody was released. So I was released about lit, and I never served another day. 
so it worked out it worked out okay but no the last year i was done i was you know i was completely i checked out i mean i had to do what i had to do i mean i had to you know to, to function but um it was uh I, if had i been asked to go to lebanon i would have refused for sure mm-hmm. i was not asked it was not something i had to do but it was uh it was it was not easy the the morale was very very low and the people around me were all kind of like my most of the people around me in that particular place that where i served we were like-minded and um it was it was uh it was terrible, and then and then and then um, to see all the 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 officers who were actually you know responsible for this for this horrible invasion, and of course Sabra and Shatila was the highlight in terms of in terms of the, the cruelty. But Lebanese were were killed, and I mean there was destruction, and there were so many Lebanese refugees. And not only Palestinians suffered from this, and thousands of Israeli casualties. And so, and then to see that those those were responsible, not only they were not punished, but eventually they were actually promoted, both in the military and even Sharon, who was who was who was found responsible for the massacres and was not allowed to serve uh, as minister of defense. He became minister of housing and then he became minister of agriculture, which are two extremely important positions in the context of the Palestinians, because it's all about land water and housing and these are three issues in which Palestinian discrimination against Palestinians is severe and he put in policies in place that were so draconian probably worse than what he would have done had he been continued to be minister of defense and of course 20 years later when you were there he was prime minister again yeah it so, that was that shocking because yeah. I was like wait how is this guy you can't be the defense minister but you can be the guy who tells the defense minister what his policy policy should be like that didn't make yeah. sense to me and I remember that was another yeah. time when I was like I don't understand the logic of this and that was when I of course started learning about Likud and the right-wing Israeli politics and in meeting both left-wing and right-wing folks in Israel and Palestinians who are Christian and Palestinians who are um, who are Muslim. And it was just like, it again, layers upon layers of stuff here. It, did your parents at that time also agree with you about your, were, were you sort of on the same level as your parents politically when you were thinking like, yeah. hey, I'm leaving the IDF, this is BS, I'm doing stuff that doesn't make oh, any no, sense? Oh, no, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. We were all on the same page pretty much, yes. I mean, you know, my father was a pretty smart guy, and so the rest of us kind of, you know, respected his opinions and his views. And he was, he was, you know, nine point nine times out of ten on these issues, he was he was right on the money. And so, yeah, but I wasn't. It wasn't that I was engaged politically at that point as much as I am now. Not certainly not, but I was engaged because I grew up in a family where this was, you know, like my daughter says, it's the family business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Narcos and Valley business, yeah. Were you studying martial arts at that time? Because I know that sort of has a, there's a nonviolence streak to most martial arts study as well. Right. I studied martial arts. I started when I was in high school, then I had to stop while I was in the military, and then I couldn't wait to get back. That was my dream, to end this thing and then get back to training. And yes, of course, martial arts. You know, people sometimes like to compare military, the military experience to the martial arts experience. But like you say, martial arts are all about a deeper understanding and how not to use your abilities, your capabilities in fighting, how to prevent fighting and how to, it is basically a pacifist. Martial arts are basically truly a pacifist philosophy because you're not, you know, you're supposed to, the metaphor is you're supposed to, you know, sharpen and shine and sharpen and shine the sword, but if you use it, you've defiled it. <laughs> and that's basically the martial arts are. So there are, no, there are no similarities. There's no comparisons. There's no, you know, there's no place to compare the two at all. Are you considered left wing in terms of Israeli politics? Where do you fall on this spectrum? I'll tell you a funny story, okay? Okay, I'm ready um, for it. I've, I've, uh, so this is when my older kids were very young and there were elections. We're sitting around the dinner table and my younger son asks my older son if we are uh, right wing, left wing, or Democrats, Republicans, something like that. And my older son says, well, Republicans are here, Democrats are here, and dad is over there. <laughs> so, yes, of course, it's, it's left wing. Paul. I mean, you know, I, I think on this issue, on the issue of Palestine, I think the right wing, left wing thing is, 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 is not accurate because 
Yeah, right wing and left wing. There's a lot more that's involved. I mean, I do, I do, uh, you know, I, 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 my politics are clearly left wing politics, but or maybe some people say radical, but not just, but not because of this particular issue. I think this particular issue, you know, transcends right left politics. It's a question of values. If you, if you, you know, if you believe in human rights, if you believe in democracy, if you believe in humanity, if you believe in equality, if you believe in justice, which has nothing to do with right left. Um, or Republican Democrat, then that then you should support. There's, it's very clear which side you should be on, on in this particular on this particular conversation. You cannot support Israel if you believe in justice, uh, freedom, and human rights, because there's a 75 year history that shows that Israel stands against all of that. Um, you cannot oppose the Palestinians' call for justice and humanity and and and, and equality. Um, and, and, and it doesn't matter if you're right or left. I mean, if you believe in those, if you believe in those values, then you, then you then it makes perfect sense to support the Palestinian call for justice, equality, and freedom. So this goes beyond right left politics. I think. Do you it's feel a values issue? Yeah, no, I, I completely understand that it's a, a values issue. I, I I think that's well stated. Do you feel alienated by Israelis for your opinions on this, or Americans and Israelis for that matter? Because it, it seems like. You know, I was looking for people who were counterpoints to other people I've had on the show, and your name came up multiple times. And usually there's just huge lists of people on each side. And it was like more than one person mentioned your name. And I thought, oh, OK, this guy must be really getting out there. But also, while a ton of people support the things that you do and say, it seems like in your in your very hometown, there might be a lot of people who are like, there goes Miko the traitor. Look at this guy. Uh, do you feel well, alone it- or isolated at all by this? I'm not alone. I'm not isolated. But again, that's not the, those people, is, Israelis, uh, who are loyal to this state, to this, this uh, apartheid and racism, are not my people anyway. It's not my community. And so, uh, you know, I was um, I was supposed to go and visit. Um, I don't call it called country Israel. I call it Palestine. I was supposed to go visit. I was going to Jordan for a few days, and I was going to cross the river and go to the other side. And it was made very clear to me that if I crossed to the other side, I would be arrested. And who knows how long I'd have to deal with that. So I didn't go. And that was the first because I traveled there extensively. And so, Just yes. You and, couldn't go because at that time because they were like, you particularly couldn't go now, or nobody can go? No, me particularly. Oh. This is after, this is post October 7th. I see. Just recently. And so, and so I opted not to go and not to, you know, deal with that. But um, so, yes, of course, it, uh, Israelis see somebody like me. I mean, they, they all kinds of were traitors or whatever. I mean, I, I think it's ridiculous to call somebody like me a traitor because I, to me, my loyalty is to the values that I espouse. The fact that there happens to be a state that claims that I am part of it or it's part of my identity has got nothing to do with my values. If it does not, if they don't share my values, then there's no loyalty. There's no, there's no call for loyalty. So yeah, of course. They, yeah. But but again, the, I I I always tell people I I had I won many more friends than I ever lost. You know the community that I work within, the Palestinian community, the pro justice community. You know the pro peace community is is far larger, and and, and, um, and the experiences I've had with people, both personally and and you know at work, are profound, absolutely profound. Tell me, can I ask about your niece in her passing? Yeah. T- yeah. Tell me, tell me about that. So uh, September 1997, on the 4th of September, there were, this was a time, you know, that summer of 1997, uh, this two years, 96, 97, 98, there was a lot of violence going on. And, um, and then uh, on the, the particular, a particular uh, uh, on that particular day, on the September the 4th, there was, a, um, there was a massive attack by Palestinians where three young Palestinians blew themselves up and killed a bunch of Israelis in Ben Yehuda Street. And uh, my sister's little girl, 13-year-old girl, was, was one, of the, one of the victims. She was killed. And um, I was, actually, I go on and tell you the whole story, kind of, you want me to I, I just, expand, you, expand on it? Yeah, I, I think, just tell me, you know, how that ended up changing your, your view of this conflict. Because it's, obviously, it's a striking moment in your story, but I assume it has a greater, yeah. it, a ripple effect in, in the way that you think about oh, yeah. this. Oh, yeah. Well, look, the the... I think the only reason that people ever, 
you know, changed dramatically in terms of their thinking, in terms of their ideology, in terms of their belief is sadly, it's usually the result of something terrible. Mm-hmm. It shocks us to the core and forces us to look at things we never thought we needed to look at. And this is precisely that kind of a thing. So I, you know, I was there, I went back home, you know, sat with the family for you know, a week or so and and then you come home and it was just lost. I mean, you need to talk to people and there's nobody. You know, number one, the whole issue of Palestine is not something people are keen to talk about. And now particularly you have a story like this that people just don't know how to respond to. So it was called, but what I did, what happened as a result of this, my search to find somebody to talk to is that I came across the Palestinian community. I was living in San Diego at the time. And this was a very generous and very active uh, community of Palestinians who I began to get involved with and kind of adopted me in a way, in many ways, and um, and mentored me. And so that was the experience. And I always say the first time I met Palestinians was actually in the United States, in San Diego. You know, I was 40 years old. Having grown up in Jerusalem, which is supposedly a mixed city, I never met Palestinians because Israelis live in a bubble. Palestinians live outside of that bubble, and that's the end of it, as you saw when you were there. I mean, so I, that I was lived my and met experience. with tons of Palestinians, but I was in university. It's, that's a different bubble, You're on right? campus. Yeah. You're on campus, yeah, yeah. right. And so, uh, so anyway, so that was my experience. And then through that encounter with these Palestinians who, who the conversation was, was, was flowing immediately. The sense of, of, of uh, the connection was made immediately. The memories of where we're from and so on and so forth. And while other Jewish people and Israelis would come and go, because we had these little dialogue groups, mm-hmm. and um, they'd go, oh, can you sit with these people? They're anti-Semites, they're liars. I thought, first of all, they're not anti-Semitic. They're very nice people. And they couldn't all have, couldn't all be liars. I mean, they couldn't have all sat together and made up the story, right? So that was that was what catapulted me to uh, meeting the Palestinians and learning about the Palestinian story, which it then forced me into a life of activism and and to really reevaluate everything I believed was true. I, I heard you speaking Arabic in one of the videos. Do you speak fluent Arabic or pretty fluent Arabic? Pretty fluent, yeah, yeah pretty fluent. Yes. And you just learned that yeah. through? Did you just learn that through conversation with Palestinians? Or did no, you... no, 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 no. I studied. I studied. Okay. Uh, I studied for 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 many years. Yeah. It seems like the only way to really learn <laughs> something like Arabic. Well, you need to do both. You need a combination of both. You need yeah. to study, and you also need to converse. You yeah, need yeah. to have to know how to how to talk, which is you know not always exactly the same as what you learn in the textbook. But yeah. Well, read, especially the reading, you, know, you hear about Arabic, like there's the different letters for the beginning of the word, the end of the word, and the middle of the word. And I'm like, oh, man. And that used to be so intimidating until I started learning Chinese. And now it would kill for any kind of alphabet at all, right? Like, right. I don't care how many letters well, it has. Right, right, right. Yes. Characters. Yeah. Uh, well, it's very similar to Hebrew. I mean, it's, there's a lot of similarities to Hebrew. So coming from Hebrew to Arabic or Arabic to Hebrew, a lot of similarities. Oh, uh, that's, yeah, that's an advantage I hadn't thought of. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Remember, you can also enjoy The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our podcast feed is a treasure trove of insights from intellectuals, authors, spies, artists, athletes, pioneers, engineers, former mafia bosses, and business leaders, all sharing their secrets to success. For more information, click the link in the description. Now, back to the show. I've heard you say... And I don't let me put words in your mouth, so I'm just asking you to clarify your position here. I heard you say Hamas isn't a terrorist group, or, or more specifically that October 7th wasn't a terror attack. And again, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Is that an accurate—am I accurate with that, or did I misunderstand you? No, you didn't misunderstand me. That's exactly what I said. Okay. I don't believe the Hamas. I don't believe the Palestinians are terrorists. I don't believe the Palestinian resistance is terrorism. I think it's wrong to uh, categorize it as terrorism. It's simplistic, it's superficial, and it's not true. And um, and as a, as a result of that, I don't think what they what Palestinians do when they resist is, is are acts of terrorism. I think that the state of Israel has been engaged in terrorism since before it was even established. The Zionist movement in Palestine had brought terrorism to Palestine. Palestine there was no such thing as terrorism before the Zionists came and started killing people. And so when people are um, governed by this ruthless regime, apartheid state, which, by the way, if anybody has a problem with the word apartheid, Amnesty International came out with a report last year, and that explains very well why the state of Israel was being accused of apartheid. And so when you, uh, when you have this very, very ruthless 
and uh, I would say even savage apartheid regime that is treating Palestinians in this particular way. And the Palestinians stand up, a nation that's never had a military force, they've never had a tank or, or warplane, you know, much less, uh, you know, and, um, and they stand up and resist. That's resistance. That's not terrorism. Terrorism is what the state of Israel is doing. Wouldn't that be... Well, uh, let me let me back up. In the book, there's a part where you say, hey, harming civilians makes no sense. If you harm the military, then you're harming the state. But harming civilians, I think you said something like, what's the point of harming civilians? I think this is in that, actually not the book, the Vimeo trailer, that, the cut that you sent me. So then when we talk about the Hamas attack on October 7th, it seems like you have a different opinion. So has your opinion shifted since that was filmed? Or do you consider all Israelis combatants? Or is there something else going on there? So the the, the 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 passage you're referring to is in the book, but it wasn't me saying it. It was Abu Ali Shaheen, who was a, a leader in the Palestinian resistance for many many years, and he was cap he was uh, he was captured and spent uh, almost twenty years in, in solitary, and he was a very important, a very charismatic leader. And I met him. Just the book was already done, but then I met him and I added the chapter about him because he was such an important figure. And he says that that as a commander of the Palestinian resistance, he that was his perspective. Mm. Now, the problem is that Israel has been inflicting so much violence against Palestinian citizens, because really, all Palestinians are citizens. They've never had a military force. They've had the resistance cells. They've had guerrilla groups. They've never had a military. So Palestinians are all civilians. And when Israel goes into Gaza and, and mass kills thousands, as they've been doing for many years, not this is not the first time, then uh, they're killing civilians. Now, um, which is a terrible thing either way. Now, the thing is this, if the power that initiates the violence wants to end the violence, it has the power to do so. You can't come to the people who are on the receiving end and say, well, you don't have a right to do what we do. You don't have a right to kill civilians. We have a right to kill civilians, but you don't. And as a matter of fact, and in my other book, An Injustice, I mentioned this, when the founder of Hamas, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, who was a paraplegic, an old paraplegic, he was in Israeli jail right around the 90s, right with the period of violence that I was describing. And at one point, the Israelis came to him and said, would you tell your people to stop targeting civilians? Because, you know, buses were being blown up and all this. And he said, uh, I'm willing to sign an agreement right now where both sides promise to refrain from targeting civilians. They never came back. <laughs> the Israelis never came back. Because if they're going to kill Palestinians, they have to kill civilians because there are no because the mili- there's no military, you know? And so and and Israel's the, the the reasoning behind Israel's you know massive attack against civilians is revenge, is punitive is to try to teach them a lesson not to raise their heads, which, of course, all three have failed. And so it's not that I, I, I've i changed my mind about killing civilians. So killing anyone is a terrible. Everybody has a mother and a father or a child. Can you imagine that? It's, hor- it's a horrifying thing, you know. But we can't come and, and demand one thing from the victim and demand a different thing for the person the, from, from the side, the perpetrator, all the, you know, this enormous amounts of violence. I mean, and think about it for the last 75 years. The state of Israel was established after a massive, a massive assault against Palestinian civilians where almost a million people were forced out of their homes. We don't even know how many were massacred because the massacres are still being unraveled today and and, and being revealed today of things that we didn't know. And there were countless massacres. And so to then say, yeah, well, we're going to not talk about that. But why are they killing civilians? That doesn't fly. That doesn't work. We should stop killing all civilians. We should... We should, by all means, allow the refugees to return. We need to dismantle the apartheid state, and we need to let Israelis and Palestinians live together in peace. Absolutely, so nobody gets killed anymore. That should be the that should be the goal. I, I think you covered this a little bit, but I'm gonna I'm gonna ask it anyway because I'm trying to stave off the ten thousand emails I'm gonna get from people saying you let them say this without pushing back. So what happened on October seventh in your view? Because it seems like in some ways, and I I. I'm not sure about this because, again, I think you covered it. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding, but it seems like some people are going to say, hey, he's dehumanizing or shrugging off Israeli casualties in the exact same way that he's accusing a lot of people of shrugging off Palestinian casualties. And I'm not sure that's what I'm hearing, but I think a lot of people are going to hear that. Does that? I'm sure you hear that all the time. 
So what we do know on October the 7th is we know that Palestinians, Palestinian fighters came out of the Gaza Strip, one of the poorest and most oppressed places on earth. Uh, they came by air, they came by sea, they came by land, um, and they managed to basically occupy half of historic Palestine. The, other, the entire southern half of the country was taken by them, including a massively important uh, large military base, which is the base of the Gaza Brigade. You know, and I believe they captured the general in charge. So this is this is a massive humiliation for the Israeli military, which once again proved itself that when it's being challenged and surprised, it's it's useless. Now there are many casualties as a result of that. Immediately, Israeli casualties. Well, we know we don't know who we don't know for sure what happened. We do know this, and this is according to Israeli sources, according to witnesses. We know that Israeli tanks were shelling homes where hostages were held. So we know that many Israelis were killed by the military right there and then. We know that the very first hours, the very first response was from helicopters, military helicopters that came. And we know now, because there have been several articles in the Israeli papers about this, that they could not differentiate between the Palestinians and the Israeli civilians. And so they killed both. And so nobody knows. So nobody knows who killed how many Israelis. We know that there's a large number of Israelis that were killed. We don't know what happened that has not yet been investigated. So we don't know. We do. The only thing we do know is that many were killed by Israeli fire. How many were killed by Palestinians, if at all? We don't know. That's not yet been revealed. That's not been been, been told. We also know for sure that for a very long time, Israel has been massacring civilians, not, not before, but long before October the 7th in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, you know, in, in other parts of, of, of Palestine, in Lebanon, and so on, on a regular basis. We're talking about thousands of civilians being massacred or being killed. We do know, I did this debate yesterday with some former British uh, minister, um, and they talk, you know, all these rumors about babies being burned and that sort of thing. We know for sure, now that's been that's been refuted, so we know that's not true immediately, but we know, although nobody wants to get to the gore details, when a one-ton bomb or a half-ton bomb falls on a city block full of civilians with children, do we really want to get into the gory details of what happens to these little bodies of the children? Today, we know that there are thousands of children missing, which means they're under the rubble, mm. which means we don't know if they're alive or dead, which is even worse than thinking I mean, that they're dead. You know what I mean? It's a safe assumption so, I mean, that they died horribly, I think. At this so point. exactly. So if we want to get into the nitty gritty of the horrors of war, by all means, but I think the Israelis are going to lose this conversation, which takes me back to what I said earlier. Let's end it. This is an opportunity to end it. October 7th was a major, I believe, uh, you know, a, a watershed moment, or it can be a watershed moment, to end this for good, to demand a political solution that will end this for good. The state of Israel is still paralyzed was paralyzed for a very long time. People, you know, nothing was working. Now they're gaining a little bit. But this, I was talking to a friend today. The state of Israel is paralyzed. And this is, again, from a small group of fighters that came out of one of the poorest, most depressed places on earth. And so this big democracy with this massive military force that's supposed to be so capable, we're completely, you know, this is a moment in history that can be used in order mm -hmm. to bring about positive, something positive out of this terrible sacrifice of all the suffering. Question is, is anybody sitting there at the table that has got that kind of vision? And I don't see that, unfortunately, yeah, not yet, I, at least. I, I, I have questions about that if we, if we have time later in the show, because I agree. I'm like, who's doing this? It's not, it's not Netanyahu, who most likely is has diverted so many resources from protecting Israel to push into settlements that this was allowed to happen in the first place. And then there's the conspiracy theory part of the spectrum where it's like they knew and they let it happen so that it was an excuse to invade. I don't yes. really know. I mean, nobody really can tell you whether or not that's accurate, but it's just it's just such a mess. Like it's the not, fact that it's, it's even not, being floated. It's not. It's not accurate. There is the only reason it's being floated is like those rumors about killing babies and raping women. The only reason it's being floated is you know, to discredit the, the, the capabilities of the Palestinians. So if Palestinians do something, then it's a crazy mob that burns babies and rapes women. Mm -hmm. And if they succeeded in something, it's because Israel was pulling the strings. Because Palestinians are Arabs, and Arabs are incapable of being successful oh, in anything, unless there's somebody like Israel who's pulling the string because they control everything. You know, it's nonsense. The, it's like the, bigotry the, the, the of low expectations or whatever that's exa called. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so 
this is a loaded question, but I'm going to do it anyway. Would you consider yourself pro Hamas or more pro Palestine? And is there a meaningful difference here? I don't think there's a meaningful difference. I don't care if these guys are Hamas or, or some other group. I don't think it matters. These are Palestinians who came out to fight for their people, to fight for their nation, to fight for their freedom. I think if it, you think if there was no Hamas, there wouldn't be somebody else. There'd be somebody else. That's not the issue. I don't care what affiliate who they're affiliated with. I don't think it matters it's to any Palestinians who they're affiliated with. These are Palestinian fighters who came and are fighting for the liberation of the freedom of their people. That's the bottom line. And again, I think framing it as pro-Palestinian or not pro-Palestinian is is a little misleading or very misleading because once again, supporting the cause, the Palestinian call for justice and freedom ultimately will lead to the possibility of peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Because at the end of the sentence is a free Palestine from the river to the sea with equal rights, free democratic states in, on all of historic Palestine with equal rights, where Israelis and Palestinians can live together. Supporting the other side, supporting Israel means supporting what we're seeing now, this state that has been accused by Amnesty International of the crime of humanity, a crime of uh, apartheid, which is a crime against humanity, and the kind of vicious violence that we're seeing now against civilians in, in, in Gaza. And we've been seeing really Palestinians have been living a life of terror for 75 years, a life of terror, a daily life of terror every single day for seven, 75 years since Israel was established. So this is the choice. It's not pro-Palestine, pro-Israel. It's pro-freedom, pro-equality, pro-justice, or pro-violence and racism. Mm -hmm. These are the choices. And I want to clarify something or give you the opportunity to clarify something because this is the from the river to the sea thing is so confusing for a lot of people. And it's it, it, so in the book, you talk about your support of the Palestinian state or a Palestinian state in the West Bank, Gaza, with Jerusalem as its capital. Is that still like kind of where you're at with this? Uh, and it, well, at the end of the, at the end of the book, at the end of the book, what I say is that my realization is that all of all the entire country is occupied Palestine. Right. Oh, yeah. The Sorry. So it seems like you, yeah. you now it includes yeah. modern day Israel as Palestine in one state of Palestine from the river to the sea. I should have read the rest of my notes. That's what I, that's what I get from right. trying to wing it. Right. 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 Um, so. Tell us what from the river to the sea actually means, because some people are like, oh, it just means everyone should live together democratically and live happily ever after. And other people are like, no, it means get rid of all the Jews. And I'm like, eh, which I, so much bad faith online. It's like you don't even what do you think? What does it mean when you say it? What does it mean? Well, I know what it means when I say it. I know what it means when Palestinians uh, uh, say it and when people that I work with say it. And I know what it means. What it means it's very simple. From the river to the sea refers to all the historic Palestine. So on the east, it's the River Jordan. In the west, it's the Mediterranean. In the north, it's the borders with uh, Lebanon and Syria. In the south, it's the Gulf of Aqaba and the border with, with Egypt. You know, it's very clearly defined. You know, every single map you look at before 1948, that region is called Palestine going back thousands of years. You know, And so from the river to the sea means freedom over all of historic Palestine, freedom from apartheid, freedom from checkpoints, freedom from violence, freedom from racism. Where, like I said earlier, the possibility of Israelis and Palestinians living together in peace becomes a reality. That's how you make it a reality. It's the only way that you can make it a reality. It's like white South Africans and black South Africans couldn't possibly live in peace under apartheid. Israelis and Palestinians can't possibly live in peace under a regime where I have privilege over my Palestinians' friends. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. I There's think no possibility are, of it ever happening. I think people are afraid that Israel might start to look like South Africa after the fact, uh, because it's not the country is not in good shape right now. Now the di the reasons for that are different than oh they integrated. Yeah, it's, <laughs> like, very it's like I want to be well, very no, clear. No, it's, well, I mean South Africa had what 40, 50 million Africans who never had the opportunity to go to school, right? Who were impoverished. You know, a vast majority. Israeli and Palestinian societies are highly educated societies. Israeli Palestinian societies can go to work if tomorrow morning. The apartheid regime fell. You had elections, and you had a free democratic state with equal rights. It would be a flourishing, functioning democracy immediately. You got people waiting. You know, in, in Gaza, in Gaza. Every time I talk about Gaza, now I just think of all the people I know that have been killed and their families. But you know, Gaza has, I think, the large one of the largest uh, PhD per capita in the world. You know, we're talking about very highly educated, very productive societies that can go to work the next day. We're not talking about 
you know, just beginning to educate millions and right. millions of people. What some people might say, hey, though, democracy in the Middle East, uh, in an, uh, that's a fairy tale. No other state in the area has a democracy. Even Hamas and Fatah haven't had elections in a decade or more. How? What, what do you say to that? I say it's nonsense. It's racism and it's nonsense. The state of Israel is certainly not a democracy. It's never been a democracy. It's been an apartheid state from the very beginning. It was a democracy for people like myself. But we are now less than half of the population, so that's not considered a democracy. Um, but the, the reasons that the reasons that so many other countries in the region don't have democracies is because there are greater powers that are preventing them. Mm -hmm. There's more interest in, in, in arming uh, dictators and keeping them in power so that their foreign policy would be aligned with the U.S. and, and, and the Europeans and so on. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, Palestinians and Israelis actually have had, you know, traditions of democracy going back a very long time, ever since their political lives were, were, there, were there were these political entities existed, there were democracies and they have a dem and there's no reason to expect it wouldn't be a democracy. And, 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 and again, we're not talking about a country where you place a king and you say, okay, he's the ruler. We're going to arm him. We're going to send him a lot of money, and we're going to make sure there's no democracy, which is what happened in a lot of countries in the region. Is you know, Palestine. Palestine is not like that. It's a completely different reality. It's a completely different, different character of the people, the character of the of the of the country. It always has been. What do you say to the Israelis who say, "Well, if we let them do this, they're just going to wipe out all the Jews and take our stuff," which is what you know happened to them earlier. I mean, it, a lot of people are afraid of that, right? They they feel like. Even if they agree with you, they're like, I still don't want to get exterminated by the Palestinians coming back to Jerusalem, where I live now. I don't know what in the world makes them say that. I mean, there's no history to that. There's no reason to expect that. Why would anybody say? I don't know why anybody would think that. I mean, I there's worried. no history. There's no. There's no history to that, and there's no. Re and again, there's no history. The history of Jews in, in in Arab countries is the history, a long history of of. of of coexistence, even in Palestine, well, and you being expelled to Jews, and pogroms. I mean, to be fit, come on, we got to be fair. In the, not in the Arab world. Not in the Arab world. Not in the Arab world. Really? In the Arab world. Not in the Arab world. This is the experience of Jews in Europe. Mm. This has never been the experience. And I would, I highly recommend you read a book. Where is it? I have it here. I will. By Israeli, I, by Israeli yeah. historian Avishlai. It's called uh, Three Identities: the, the Memoir of an Arab Jew. He is from Iraq, and he talks about the Iraqi community and what it was like for them, for Jews in Baghdad. This is not the experience of Jews in the Arab world. And if you listen to, you know, there were Jewish communities in Jerusalem, in Hebron, in the north, in Tabaria, and Safad, and so on, and they lived in harmony. They've always lived in harmony. They always lived well together. They shared the same values. They babysat each other's children. I mean, the, the relations between Jews and Arabs, even in Palestine, was very, very good until the Zionists came. And the same thing happened in Iraq. The same thing happened in Syria. The same thing happened in all of North Africa. Jews lived very well in the Arab world. The Arab world welcomed Jews. And when Jews were escaping from Europe, the Arab world is where they came to, and very often where they came to to be to find protection. But that was not the experience. And what the Zionists are doing now, what Israel is doing now, they're perpetuating this revi revisionist history that says that the Arabs, uh, that the Jews in the Arab world, there were pogroms and they were kicked out. None of this is true. This is absolutely not true. Yeah, because of course, absolutely not that's true. what I've been reading, right, is it's like, oh, well, the, all the Arabic Jews from Iraq and Morocco, et cetera, had to leave because of... They didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave. Well, right. None of them wanted to leave. And there are particular stories, I don't, we don't have time to get into it now, yeah. but the particular stories of each and every country and what happened and why they end up leaving, there are tragic stories and the people are, are regret leaving. You know, because they were there for generations, and 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 Arab Jewish, the the cultures, the culture of Arab Jews, was a very rich and distinct uh, culture, and it was respected by the countries in which they lived. Again, including Palestine. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, that's definitely contrary to some of the things that I've been learning and reading about. I I need you to send me that book title at some point because I just tried to Google it and I got a bunch of math books. Three identities is not uh, specific enough, I guess. Uh, but definitely... memoir of a memoir memoir of an Arab Jew. His name is Avi Schlein. A V I S H L A I M. There it is. Three yeah. worlds memoirs it's... of an Arab. Three worlds. That's three why, worlds. Yeah, three like, it's trying to Sorry, show yes. me. It's trying to show me order of operations and calculus, and I got PTSD flashbacks. And. He and he's not only a, you and me both. He's not only uh, a very important historian who's written a lot about the Middle East, but um, 
his his own family story as having uh, left Iraq and what it was like for them in Baghdad and the entire Jewish community at the time, the story of Arab Jews in general and what happened when they came to Israel and how they were treated by, you know, by the by the community of Israelis that already existed by the Zionists. It's a very important lesson. Um, well, this is because a new book, we have July eleventh, twenty twenty three. I'm yeah, definitely going to read it. It just came out. It yeah. just came out. Do you know it this just guy? Came out. I know him well. Yes, it might be that might be an interesting guy for the show because this stuff is fascinating. It'd be a wonderful, it'd be a wonderful guy for a show. Absolutely. So, in the time that we have left, I'd love to talk about how we find a solution here, one that works not only for Palestinians but Israel, or not just for Israelis, but for Palestinians as well. I guess you can say both in either order, but one uh, seems more. Uh, apropos of this conversation. What is the compromise, though? And and what do you see as the role of the U.S. slash the West in general in this conflict? Because I, I am seeing a lot of parallels between how the U.S. acted post 9-11 from, from Israel. I think many would agree that we overreacted and that did not work well for us in the long term. And it seems like Israel's falling into the same trap. Even Joe Biden is warning Israel against falling into this exact trap that it seems like they have fallen into. As he sends them more money and weapons, wow. um, so so there are no secrets in how this ends. There are only two options. One is a short-sighted, short-lived option, which is the continuation of the apartheid state, the continuation of the oppression, and the killing of Palestinians. That is short-lived and short-sighted. The, the majority of the, there are about twelve million. 12 and a half million people living between the river and the sea, between the, you know, within, within historic Palestine. Seven million of them or seven and a half million are Palestinians. So they're they are a majority. And they're going to be a bigger majority because traditionally they have more children. Anyway, it's, it's you know. So they're going to be a larger majority. This minority of racist, uh, of a racist society that is governing through an apartheid regime can only last so long. So it's, I think it's inevitable it's going to collapse. It's short-sighted. It's racist. It's violent, mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 it's going to be short lived. The other option is, I believe, the preferred option and the option that anybody who has a conscience and a heart and and values needs to espouse is the possibility of a free Palestine, post apartheid, the dismantling of the apartheid state, just like was done in South Africa through a lot of pressure, through sank severe sanctions, through boycotts, through severe divestment. You know, South Africa, people forget, controlled all of Southern Africa, all the way up to Angola. It had all, it had gold and uranium and a great deal of resources. It was a very rich country, and people in America did not want to end it. People in, uh, you know, banks and corporations, the people who were doing business with apartheid in the American administrations also did not want to fight it. But it fell. Um, and so I believe that through, again, sanctions and boycotts and, and, and whatever it takes, the apartheid regime in Palestine needs to be brought down to its knees. It needs to, it needs to uh, be dismantled and replaced with a real democracy, a free democratic Palestine from the to the sea with equal rights. Now, that's base camp. Now we're starting the work. Now we're starting to figure out how we do this. Now you got to figure out how Israelis and Palestinians can function together in a single political entity, in a single new state that has never existed before. And there's never been a state where Israelis and Palestinians, there's never been a, a situation, even a moment, where Israelis and Palestinians lived as equals or functioned as equals in Palestine. And so now we're starting to build this thing. And I don't think it's impossible to build because I think at the end of the day, even with all the animosity and the violence, the history of violence and so on, people want to move on. People want to get on with their life. They want to raise their kids. They want to go to work. And like I said earlier, <clears throat> this democracy with equal rights, and, and again, these two highly educated communities, highly educated societies that are ready to go to work the next day, will be able to function as, a, as an excellent, very productive democracy the next day. Now, will there be people who will try to stop it? Will there be people who, who pick up a gun and try to fight it? Of course, a minority. There will be a minority who will die trying. Well, that's the way it is. If they choose to pick up a gun and kill somebody, they'll have to you know, pay the consequences. But hopefully the rule of law will prevail, as it usually does in the end. And we've seen, I mean, we've seen dictatorships in Latin America fall and, and, and be turned into democracies. We saw Which, South Africa. Can we you saw, give an example of uh, Latin America? I'm, I, I can't, I'm drawing a blank. 
were addicted all of Latin America. All, all of Latin, of Latin America. America. I see. You're Chile, like Chile, Argentina, yeah. Chile, yeah, Argentina, Pinochet, all of these. I mean, yeah. eventually they fell and, 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 and turned into democracies. And so, um, and again, South Africa and others, there are other examples. So the possibility of replacing a, a, a totalitarian racist regime into a democracy exists. Now, the role of the U.S. in this is extremely important because obviously the U.S. provides a lot of funding and a lot of uh, weapons and, and diplomatic you know, cover, which is maybe even more important. This is our problem as taxpayers, that our money is going to support violence and racism as opposed to using our money to build schools and, cl and provide clean water and provide all the things that people need here in this country. Why is our ta why our tax why is our tax money going there without us even being asked? And and the responsibility that we have is to demand of our elected officials, and it starts at the at the level of of you know people running for school board, and city council, and state legislatures because because it starts there, and we need to demand that they stop sending money, they they stop going on junkets, that they stop supporting and promoting themselves as Zionists. If we believe in zero tolerance to racism, there should, Zionism should not have a, a room anywhere because it's a racist ideology. So we need to be consistent about that as voters and as consumers of the media. Because when Bill Maher or, 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 um, uh, or, or Jordan Peterson interview Netanyahu and give him a platform mm. to spew these absurd lies, these absurd lies that justify his violence and his racism and don't challenge him at all, we as consumers of this media need to challenge him and say, what are you doing giving him a platform like that? <laughs> they don't even ask him about his, about his, Corruption. about his being indicted. I yeah. mean, yeah. So, I mean, we need to, we need to step up because we are complicit because it's our money. It's, it's funny. You mentioned the Netanyahu interviews. Cause I, I think I saw a headline. I, I want to say it was like in Haaretz or something in Israeli newspaper where it said the headline was if Netanyahu gives you an interview, it's because he thinks you're an idiot. And it's because it's like, he'll only go on a show where he can just unchecked say whatever he wants, which is unfortunately true for a lot of politicians. Um, but yeah, it, I, look, Israel's moved quite far to the right compared to where it was when I was there at the time. I think it was Ehud Barak who was in charge of things. And it seems like there's no credible path to peace with somebody like Netanyahu and the Likud party, so the Israeli right-wing party in power over there. That seems like that has to change before we see any progress at all. No, I don't think so. You don't think uh, so? It doesn't matter. No, because the entire Zionist project is a racist project. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. who his prime minister is. Ehud Barak uh, was no less uh, responsible for what we're seeing today than Netanyahu is. It is one building on the other building on the other. It was the same policies that led to this. And so I, I don't think it matters who the prime minister is. I mean, uh, the clerk who was the president of South Africa when apartheid collapsed was not a particularly, you know, uh, you know, tolerant person. He just happened to be the guy at the moment that it collapsed. And it could be Netanyahu when, when apartheid collapses. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to happen because Israeli society and Israeli politics go right or left. It's going to happen because they are forced onto their knees. A racist society and a racist state will only seed power when they're absolutely forced to. South Africa had nowhere to go. The boycotts, the sanctions were killing them. The divestment was killing them. They could not travel. They could not play sports. They could not participate in any sporting, academic, cultural, diplomatic, political events. You would be penalized if you invited a South African team to a sporting event as, a, as an international body. It was that severe. That is what's going to bring about the change. It's not going to be a particular Israeli prime minister. It's going to be even the pressure from the outside. And sadly, even the Palestinians within Palestine who are spitting blood and, and spilling blood and doing everything they can, they are like prisoners in a maximum security prison. The, their, their ability to bring about change is, is, is very limited. We are the ones that can bring about a bright future to Israelis and Palestinians if we pull our support from this idea of Israel to the idea of peace and justice and so forth. Well, it seems like big strides between Israel and Palestinians in terms of the peace process have actually always happened after big violent clashes. So maybe there's room for optimism here. And I know Obama used to say we can't want peace more than they do, which sounds catchy, but I think is kind of wrong. I think once great powers are drawn into the conflict because it flares up like this, this is actually the type of attention and dedication of resources that are going to be required to get anywhere. Because we do need Turkey, Egypt, the U.S., Jordan, 
China, the EU, and other powers, regional and global, to actually focus on this, or we're just going to keep watching this movie over and over again for 200 more years. But what, do you agree with that assessment at all? Well, I think all of the all of the all of the parties that you mentioned need to join, uh, need to kick out the Israeli ambassadors, like some of them already have. They need to, the South Africans have, some of the Latin American countries have, they need to pull back their uh, ambassadors from Tel Aviv. They need to end all ties with the state of Israel, all trade, all diplomatic ties, all trade ties, any ties, and the state of Israel has to become a pariah. Without that happening, I agree, nothing's going to change. So the kind of intervention that we need to see, both from the US, the Europeans, Turkey, the Arab world, and so on, is a total disconnect, you know, uh, with the state of Israel so that it is forced to agree, you know, to, to have peace, to the, the peace and justice that we're talking about. That's the kind of, you know, I was in Turkey, and Turkey is very, you know, many times, but I, I was there on a speaking tour, and my book came out in Turkish. And so they say, what do you think about, you know, Erdogan, he speaks about Palestine, he's very pro-Palestinian. I said, yes, that's excellent. But Turkey is still doing business with Israel, trade with Israel, billions of dollars worth, you know, it doesn't matter what the president says or doesn't say. What matters is what actually takes place in terms of trade, in terms of commerce, in terms of the diplomatic relations. When that ends, that's when we're going to see change. So, well, look, thank you for thank you for humoring this somewhat contentious bit of the conversation. I mean, look, there's there's stuff I don't uh, agree with you on, but it is so nice to talk to somebody who I don't necessarily agree with, who also argues in good faith. Man, it's so rare. So I want to take it just a second and express my appreciation for that because it seems uh, like pleasure. You can't have these conversations without somebody just making some some ish up and pulling it out of thin air and then getting mad at you. And this is it's just nice to not deal with that. So thank you very much. Uh, what is the Arabic on the card behind you? I meant to ask you that earlier in the show. So I uh, I'm enga and engaged in a in a uh, initiative here in Washington D.C. To um, to start a uh, to create a presence, a Palestinian presence here in Washington D.C. Because there's no Palestinian presence here, and so and the name of this presence in Arabic is Dar al Huria, House of Freedom, and that's what that says in Arabic, Dar al Huria. Uh, and so and and you know people complain, people on our side of this issue complain that you know American politicians are one sided, the media is one sided, everybody's one sided. And my argument is, well, they've never been presented with the other side, so they've never had the opportunity to make an informed decision. If anybody who was on, you know, including myself, when I was, until I was exposed to this other narrative, to this other side of the story, I was completely one-sided. And it makes perfect sense. Now, there are other reasons why the U.S. supports Israel so, but this is clearly one reason. I mean, and when you, when you talk to American politicians, they always say, well, the, the APAC is always here in our offices. There's nobody else presenting anything, which is true. You know, they get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails every single day, every congressional office, every senator's office, you know, the the, the media, the diplomatic corps, they are all over the place. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody speaking, nobody telling the other story. So to create a, a physical presence here in Washington, D.C. that will do that, <clears throat> present this, the, the, you know, be a presence for Palestine and present the Palestinian story, the, present the Palestinian cause or the case for Palestine, and also be a place where people can come to and get and, and hear lectures and see the art and learn about the culture and learn about the archaeology and learn about the history. We talk to people about the history of Palestine, they can think maybe as far as 1948, maybe, if that. There's a history that goes back, you know, thousands of years. So to create that uh, is, is, is I, I believe, is the only way that we're ever going to see change. And so a friend made this in Arabic calligraphy. What's the name again? It's called Dar al Horia, the House of Freedom. Miko, thank you for doing the show, man. I really appreciate it. I I, I know this conversation was not super easy because it's uh, <clears throat> a little different than usual. So I just appreciate you doing it and and humoring me as well. It's been it's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right, everybody. Usually I don't do a show close on YouTube. I usually do the clothes and all the extra stuff on the podcast only feed. But today, there's a little, there's some stuff I got to iron out. First, thanks again to Miko for coming on the show. Again, normally, you know, I just don't bother with the clothes. I just do the interview and here we go. But I, I just got to say, I'm not sure how you can square the Hamas thing. He, he said they're not a terrorist organization. I'm open to different interpretations of what people mean by that. But come on, they filmed their attacks 
and they streamed them. So saying that they were just taking hostages when they took video of themselves decapitating a Thai farmer with a hoe, among many other executions and torture and stuff, it just, that doesn't hold water. I'm open to the idea that maybe I misunderstood what Miko said, uh, but I don't think I did. Regarding the IDF killing people on October 7th, he said that, to refresh your memory, he said that, hey, the IDF killed a bunch of those people in the crossfire. Let's assume that that's 100% correct, which I don't know if there are sources that back this up. I think it takes a long time for investigations like this to come about, and it's really, really hard to do in the chaos and fog of war. But even if the IDF killed a bunch of people in the crossfire, which is extremely tragic, that would be awful, usually when people attack something here, let's say in the United States, let's say a shooter goes into a school, if the cops accidentally kill some of the school kids while rescuing them, we're angry at the police, for sure, but in the end, it's not the police's fault, it's the person who went in and shot up the school in the first place. So what I'm saying here, what I'm getting at is, if we're arguing that Hamas only wanted to take hostages but ended up killing a bunch of people and then the IDF killed a bunch of people in the process, that's still on Hamas, not on the people defending Israelis from being kidnapped by Hamas. Would you folks agree with that here, or am I off the am I off off the reservation here? I know you're not supposed to say that, but I can't think of a better alternative. The greater point here is there's still way too many civilian deaths on both sides, especially the Palestinian side right now. Hamas, however, seems like a jihadist, almost fascist entity, which rules by force. It crushes all political dissenters in Gaza by killing, maiming, torturing them, or threatening their families. Their rampage in Israel was only an extension of what they do to Palestinians every day in the Palestinian territories. I know this from talking to Hamas supporters and people who are members of Hamas inside the Gaza Strip, inside the United States as well. This is not something that they hide or don't talk about. It's not secret. It's not classified information that Hamas tortures and hurts people inside Palestine as well. Hamas is in no way, by the way, equivalent, in my opinion, to Israel's extreme right government, which has totally discredited itself with the electorate. Netanyahu has lost his majority coalition. When the next elections are called, he will be politically dead, almost for sure. He will potentially face a trial for corruption, hope, hopefully jail in some people's mind. Now, I'm not in the weeds on Israeli politics, but it, to me, it looks like he's a dog chasing a car right now, and, and it, it, he's pretending he scared the car away. In short, now he will be held accountable. So my question becomes, when will Hamas be held accountable for their crimes against Palestinians as well as Israelis? I'm waiting for y'all to tell me when that will happen. My guess is never. Why not? Hamas could stop this war right now, pretty much immediately. Why don't the Palestinian civilians insist that they do so? Hold on before you yell at me and tell me that they can't. They can't because they're afraid of retribution, right? Okay then, so why are Palestinians so afraid of Hamas? Because they torture and kill their own people. That is not the same thing as living in a democracy or a, what might people say a flawed democracy with a government that you don't like. Please realize, y'all, that these comments are not anti-Palestinian. They are anti-Hamas, and there is a huge difference between those two things. I 100% agree that Palestinians deserve equal rights, but that cannot happen as long as a criminal pseudo-fascist entity remains in power in Gaza. They have to be disemboweled, their infrastructure has to be destroyed, their weapons have to be taken away, and their ability to harm civilians has to be removed. Of course, of course I wish there was a way to do this without any collateral damage. But I think we've all seen enough of war to know this simply isn't within the realm of possibility. It's one of the greatest injustices and tragedies of our time. That much is certain. Note that anytime there's been advancement towards peace, Hamas has intervened against it. Now, other parties have as well. We remember Yitzhak Rabin getting assassinated. But it's not like Hamas actually wants peace. They're actively working against it. Also, there's a quick fact check here. When I said there was a mistreatment of Jews in the Middle East in Muslim countries, Miko said, not in Arab states. And if I recall correctly, he said it like three or four times in a row. So he's very adamant about that. Now, that just kind of turns out to not be the case. Maybe, again, maybe I misunderstood what he was trying to tell me. But many, 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 many Jews that lived in other Middle Eastern countries were pushed out of those countries. It's something like 900,000. Some might say they were pushed out because the state of Israel was established, but 
that kind of proves my point and not his that Jews were mistreated in the Middle East in majority Muslim nations. If a Muslim country pops up in South America tomorrow or something like that, and other countries respond by kicking out all the Muslims of the places where they currently live now, let's say next to Paraguay, they open up a Muslim country in Mexico and the United States and Canada, kick all the Muslims out and make them move down there. That is not a justifiable response. You would never tolerate this excuse if the tables were turned. And that I think is what just does not sit right with me about the claim that these people were not mistreated. Again, I'm open to the idea that maybe I've misunderstood him somehow here, but I wanted to straighten some of this stuff out. I know not all of you agree with the guest. I know not all of you agree with me. Thank you for watching the show. And that's it from me, Jordan Harbinger and the Jordan Harbinger Show. Until next time. Thank you for checking out this entire episode on YouTube. If you want to follow up on this topic, check out our podcast feed or visit us on our website at jordanharbinger.com, where you can learn more about our guest and dive even deeper into what we discussed today. And remember, YouTube is not the only place that you can check out The Jordan Harbinger Show. Any podcast app should have us. Check out the links in the description where you will find access to our shows that don't appear on YouTube, like Skeptical Sunday, where we debunk topics like crystal healing, GMOs, conspiracy theories, homeopathy, tipping, even lawns, to find out if they're by science and logic, or if they're just complete nonsense. Spoiler, many of them are complete nonsense. Also, our Feedback Friday shows where we help people escape from cults, get raises at work, and take all manner of questions from you, the audience, all the way down to the bottom of the barrel. And every episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show has something useful you can take away and apply in your own life and help you navigate what I know can often seem like the overwhelming and paralyzing challenges of modern life. Life can be hard, yes, but we are here to help. And if you appreciate how we help, remember to like, comment, and subscribe.